Hello and welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. I'm Malcolm Borthwick, Managing Editor of Intellectual Capital at Bailey Gifford. Streaming service Netflix, the builder's merchant Travis Perkins and Japanese multinational SoftBank. This is a handful of companies which Bailey Gifford invests in, both through equities and bonds. So do these companies have common characteristics which attract both equity and bond investors, or is it just a coincidence? I'm joined in our studio in Edinburgh by Lucy Earls, who has been both a bond and an equity investor. Lucy is joint manager of Bailey Gifford's High Yield Bond Fund. But before we start, some important information. Please remember that as with all investments, your capital is at risk and any income from it is not guaranteed. Lucy, let's start with the differences. What do you look for in a company that might be different from an equity investor? I think the key difference is that equity colleagues are looking for growth in earnings, whereas we are looking for growth in cash flow or perhaps more um, appropriately, resilience in cash flow, as that is the key determinant of whether we will get our bonds repaid or not. It's their ability to generate cash, to support the business, to continue to grow, but also to repay us. Because essentially, at the end of the day, we have lent a company money and we, um, for doing that, expect to receive a coupon, we expect to receive interest payments for doing so, and then the money at the end of the term of the contract. So... It, it sounds uh, quite a small difference, but it totally shapes the entire way in which you look at a business. So um, you you pin it less on the blue sky scenario of um, if you're looking at a company and they're developing a new technology. It's very exciting and we want to understand that and we want to have a good grasp of that. But we want to um, understand that through the guise of also sustaining the core of the business that is generating the cash in order to pay the bond back. Um, So what's the blue sky scenario? Is that the um, optimistic scenario about growth? So the blue sky scenario for us is that the (laughs) bond will be repaid to us in full at the end of the term of the contract. Or um, it depends on our scenarios. So um, the the best blue sky scenario we had is, is spotting a company when the market doesn't understand its resilience. So an example would be Sprint, um, which is a US telco company that had was going through a very challenging time. Um, and we it had support of one of our company, another company that we invest in, SoftBank, um, which has got, you know, it's a very well financed company um, and has a lot of, of experience within this um, industry. Um, and our analysis indicated that which the market we don't think appreciated was that there was a fundamental resilience in this company um, that we think could have you know stood the test of time. And so that is um, you know blue sky scenario for a bond investor. Um, they're they're I think few and far between. Um, we invest mainly in just resilient businesses that we spot and and it's not typically the uh, distressed investing um, where we where we have our our forte. Is it that you're potentially looking as a bond investor about what might go wrong, where an equity investor is looking at what might go right? Exactly. So um, the way in which I kind of make an analogy is that that when you're on the equity teams, they're they're encouraging, you know, optimism and which is which is entirely correct for equity style investing. Um, you know, they're 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 backing them um, with conviction, and um, they're doing so for the long term. And if you know one thing goes exceptionally well, and you know four things go terribly, it doesn't matter because that one thing will have you know totally um, wiped out the loss that you'd have received on on the others. Um, bond investing, it's the complete inverse of that, So, uh, which I think arguably is a little bit harder, but that, um, <laughs> that, some people would argue with that. Um, if, if you get one thing wrong and you back it with conviction, which means you have a big position size in it, you need many, many, many things to go exceptionally well in order for to get to correct that loss. Pessimistic is maybe the wrong word, but we, we focus more on the risks, on scenario analysis, on stress testing, on on um, more on, on the balance sheet than really any of our equity colleagues would, would, would care to admit they do. And psychologically, I mean, you've moved from equity investing to bond investing. Is it hard to change that sceptical mentality to become more sceptical about companies? So um, 
I joined Bailey Gifford in the uh, trainee investment management program. And so I did two years on equity. I was UK equity first and then on global income growth. And uh, it's fair to say I, I came straight to Bailey Gifford from, from university and I, I found uh, it was a whole new world for me. Um, but I really enjoyed um, learning um, and recommending equity companies to my colleagues. But um, at the step change, I think, when I moved to uh, now the high yield team, um, within the first year, all of the equity ideas which I had, I converted into a bond case and they outperformed. So I think even though I didn't realise it, I was a bond investor and I have been since I've, I joined Bailey Gifford. I like companies where it's tangible, where you can actually evidence this is sustainable, this is going to be here in next long time. Maybe it's a little bit more boring, but I, I, I feel very conscious. It's more my style of investing and how I'd feel comfortable investing clients' money. Is that because there's, there's less margin for error as you were implying earlier? Exactly. I would entirely agree with that statement. You talk about engaging with companies. What's very interesting chatting to uh, the equity team about this is they develop relationships over a very long period of time. But I, I guess with the bond, it's almost like you have a contract for a fixed period of time. Does that affect how much you engage with the company? Yes, absolutely. So um, exactly as you say, we have a contractual relationship. So our influence um, by its very nature is is much less than our equity colleagues. Uh, the type of dialogue and conversation and, and um, you know, strategic shaping that they're hoping to kind of push the company in we do not have that to the same extent um when it comes to engagement the you would typically expect it to be at, at new issues so when the company is coming round investors at this roadshow and it, you're learning about the company for the first time um investors can essentially demand a higher return a higher coupon in order for for them to be interested in the company based on the risks that they see relating to the business. Um, more often than not in this type of environment where everyone is very, very hungry for for yield, uh, that that is not the case. And and there's been many instances of companies where we've we've seen that the risks are are so huge and that we would absolutely not want to um, engage with the company. We've stated where we would be interested in terms of um, yield and coupon, but but they've come a lot tighter than that, and we just we just have not invested. I guess that's you know our 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 means in which to 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 say that 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 is not acceptable is just not to invest. When it comes to ESG engagement, governance, and sustainability, we don't use that as a, as a potential to change management strategic direction. We're using that engagement to build up a bigger picture, to build up um, a fuller idea of the risks as well as the opportunities. Um, but it's never to really want to try and shift management's, management's thinking on that matter. And you mentioned a coupon there. Is that like a, an interest payment? Exactly. So it's, it's what you'd expect is when you get a, a loan from your bank, the interest that you pay to your bank. And let's move over to look at some of the similarities. Um, in terms of your day-to-day -day analysis of companies, what are some of the similarities with bond and equity investing? So there's many similar things that we look to um, that we look to find in a company that an equity investor would look at. Um, we, when we're looking at a bond, we're looking at its competitive position, exactly as our equity colleagues would do. We are looking at the industry in which it operates in exactly the same way as our equity colleagues would look to. We're looking to analyse the strength of management um, and their capital allocation decisions. We are uh, looking to um, see how they are approach governance and sustainability, so how they're influenced and um, interacting with the environment and society around them. We don't short a stock or a bond. That's that's something that is true across both um, ourselves and our equity colleagues. We don't profit if a company um, does poorly, that we never make money for our clients out of value destruction. We we only invest for the long term. And I think that that is very important because um, I think it allows us to um, to do kind of intellectual exercises, which I don't think are very typical of 
bond investors. So um, later on this afternoon, I'm actually going off to a reading day. Um, uh, we're looking at a, at a book uh, called Factfulness, and it's a book that's prompting you to question your natural biases. This is a bit by Hans Rosling, is it? Correct, yes. So it's a big strength of Bailey Gifford is to allow you to have the patience and long-term thinking in order to actually reflect on what you've been doing and, and then apply those that thinking and that learning to future investment cases. Another difference at Billy Gifford is a lot of the equity strategies are focusing on stock Pacific bottom up investing. So they're looking at Pacific companies and their growth potential. They're less looking at macro factors like movements and in interest rates and, and politics. Is there a correlation there to how you invest as a bond investor? Absolutely. So our sole focus when we're um, pursuing returns, long-term returns for our clients, is is from bottom-up stock selection. We spend very little time um, kind of considering macro factors. So say, for example, we had a positive view on, uh, a contrarian positive view on Italy. Um, we would not um, then do the analysis on Italy to then we go down and search for the bond, we do it the other way around. And I think that's very important as well. So it, it's finding kind of, I guess, the diamonds in the rough. That, that, um, and I think that's that's where our, our, um, our strength lies. So Brexit, US interest rates potentially going up, that doesn't come into your thinking? Uh, so I'm not saying this doesn't come into our thinking. We are obviously very cognizant of all the macro factors and um, the various developments that are going on around the world. How could you not be? Um, it's more to say that that doesn't dictate our our where we focus our investment time. And I think, as my, my example alluded, we create value by doing that because it's very easy to blanket, make blanket decisions about certain regions and, and then you miss the, the, the small the small um, uh, idiosyncratic companies that can outperform. And you're specialised on uh, high yield, in some cases, sub-investment grade. Are these bonds more risky than other bonds? I would argue absolutely not. Um, so our whole style is to invest in resilient companies over the long term. Um, we define resilience as comprising three factors. So it's a durable competitive position, good governance and a sustainable strategy, which is um, another way of talking about ESG, and then um, an appropriate capital structure. So when we're looking for a business, we score them on all of those factors. Um, and if we don't come to, um, if we're not comfortable with any of that, if we don't believe that company is resilient, we wouldn't even consider it for investment, regardless of, I guess, the return or the valuation opportunity that you could get for doing so. So that, um, in my mind, kind of huge swathes of the high yield market are just not even not even up for discussion. And what are some of the warning lights to these companies being off limits for you as an investor? Uh, well, there's many different warning lights um, that we could think of, but it, it it basically just all boils down to how resilient is that cash flow. It's a very simple way of explaining that answer. Sub-investment grade bonds, yield curves, over-the-counter market, often the language of the bond market can be esoteric and sometimes dull to investors. How, how, how do you demystify it? Um, so I would firstly agree with you. I think the language can at times be be counterintuitive and very jargon heavy. Um, when something goes wrong in a bond investment, bond yields rise, which intuitively doesn't seem like it makes sense. And when something goes well, yields fall. Um, you know, you you mentioned a few jargony words. I would argue that um, stock related jargon is is not intuitive. Um, you know, everyone has heard the stock price and the market cap and price to earnings ratio and and all of these you know various elements of of um that are more and more familiar but it's just to do with exposure um i i wonder if maybe in you know 10 20 years time we would have a very different conversation um that the kind of esoteric words that are associated with you know stock equity investing which are so familiar now the exact same would be true of bonds it um you know the the world is changing and people are thinking about investments in very different manner. Lucy, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you'll join us on the podcast again soon. Thank you. And you can find out more about our podcast, Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking at baileygifford.com. 
Also on our website is Bond Beats, which offers investors a window into our Bond team's views on a range of topics and insight into the companies and their portfolios. And many thanks to Lord of the Isles for the music. The track we've used is called Horizon Effect, which was released on permanent vacation. Thank you.